Welcome to another edition of Herding Cats. Tonight we have with us Seth Newman, who is going to talk about model railroad communications. I found Seth uh, through the Cats group, but when I was perusing the internet looking for some stuff that I might need, I came across a website for model railroad control systems, which is Seth's company. Um, and I found that he had a presentation on this model railroad communications. Sounded great. Um, keep in mind, uh, he's going to refer to some of his own products, but I found the presentation and asked him to do this. So excuse the sales pitch if anybody's offended. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Seth. Seth, if you want to go ahead and share, please do. Okay. Okay, uh, am I up, Jerry? You are. Very good. Well, you know, the internet was uh, clear proof that uh, uh, cats have taken over the world, and uh, this was simply uh, a device to uh, uh, share pictures of cats. Um, so finding a good cat meme about communications was uh, not too difficult. Um, so what I've done here is taken uh, an updated version of my uh, presentation on communications for model railroads and uh, tuned it for a, a cat's uh, audience. So I'm assuming that most people here are primarily interested in using uh, CTC. And so I'm going to focus mostly on CTC applications of telephones. Uh, there are other bits of information that are grayed out. And we can certainly uh, handle questions about those in the uh, uh, question breaks. Uh, you know, if you're working on another layout that uh, uh, isn't CTC or, uh, you know, have some other interests. So. Uh, and uh, as, as Jerry said, I do own model railroad control systems, um, but um, I'll, I'll try and keep the shameless plugs to a, to a minimum, uh, mostly using them to illustrate points I'm making and uh, simply explain how you would put a system together using uh, my products. And uh, there's certainly other ways to do it. And uh, uh, I, I guess the bottom line is, uh, if you're doing something and it's working for you, then it works. Um, end of story. So uh, uh, this is certainly not to say that this is the only way to do it. Okay, so uh, what are we going to talk about? A uh, little bit of context. We're mostly prototype modelers to a greater or lesser extent. So uh, a little history to understand. Uh, how these things developed. Uh, we'll talk a little about uh, requirements, considerations, basically the givens and druthers of your communication system. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how we're going to follow the prototype and what we're likely to selectively compress. And then we'll talk about putting a system together. And then we'll talk about some resources. Uh, and there's a bunch out there, but this is a good place to get you started. Now, when I talk about signaling systems um, and, and railroads, I'm going to give you a caveat generally in the West. This isn't necessarily true elsewhere. When I say West, uh, for, I guess, Mark's benefit and anybody else who watches later who's not in North America, uh, west means west of the Alleghenies. Uh, so there's somewhat different styles of railroading because it's a lot less dense other than right around Chicago and, uh, well, St. Louis and Kansas City pretty much uh, once you get up west of the Alleghenies. So uh, we're talking mostly about single track railroads with sidings as opposed to uh, double and four track mains. So all that said, what's going to drive your telephone system decisions? Um, the era and technology you're modeling, the jobs you want to model, what your prototype did, and the space in your railroad room. And I suppose also how much you're willing to invest uh, in strictly following uh, period equipment. 
Uh, and because we tend to be a little more modern in the CTC era, this is less of an issue than it might be for uh, timetable and train order guys. Uh, so, you know, you can almost think of the history of dispatching as the history of communications technology. Um, for most of us modeling uh, centralized traffic control, which, uh, you know, arose in the mid 20s uh, in response to booming traffic during the, you know, the roaring 20s, uh, it, it was telephone and then later switched to radio. Uh, about the time the railroads were generally moving to radio, which was kind of the 70s. Um, not that there wasn't radio earlier, but for, you know, general use of radio for controlling train movements. Uh, that would be 70s, you know, by 86, you have the u -Corps, and that's pretty much the end of timetable and train order in the beginning of DTC and track warrant control, OCS in Canada. Uh, and, and those are um, uh, a little more modern and generally assume radio. Um, here's the timeline. I think most of you are generally familiar with it. Uh, 1845, we have the telegraph. The important event is in 1851, Charles Monnot finds himself waiting at a station for a hard meet. And since he's the superintendent, he climbs down from the locomotive and asks the uh, station agent to uh, uh, telegraph ahead and find out where the opposing train is. On finding out it's two stations down and waiting for a repair, uh, he tells them, well, don't leave until I get there. That's basically, uh, you know, with right over uh, uh, the, the, the eastbound train. And that's the beginning of train orders in the United States. So that's pretty important because that continues for well over 100 years. Okay, in 1869, uh, we have the telephone invented a little serendipitously. Uh, the intent was really to uh, have an appliance for uh, the hearing impaired, but uh, we ended up with the phone and that was good. Um, by the 20s, the telephone is in widespread use for, tele for train dispatching and uh, the signaling publications of the era are, are full of glowing testimonials about how operations have been improved by implementing telephone. Uh, in the mid 20s, CTC appears, uh, but we still need to talk to crews, or I should say we actually now have the opportunity to talk to crews on the road because we certainly don't have uh, agent operators at every station anymore. Um, one of the cost justifications of CTC, of course, was firing a lot of people. So being fired, they're not around to hand up uh, instructions to crews. So we put phone booths at the end of controlled sightings. Uh, and this process continues. Uh, by the end of World War II, uh, CTC is very common on Western main lines uh, and uh, Telephone arrangements have been made typically with uh, phone booths at the end of controlled sightings. Uh, in the 60s, radios, radio comes in, and by the 80s, radio is pretty much taken over. So the period of interest is probably, you know, World War I through 1985. Uh, that we have a lot of telephone communication. Now that said, we may want to do different things on model railroads. So let's see here. Um, the questions you probably want to be asking is, what did your prototype do in the era? Um, you know, I'm thinking mo most of us, again, are interested in CTC or TCS, which is the union switch and signal uh, product name. CTC was actually GRSs. Uh, we talked about phone booths. Um, so the question then is, well, what jobs do we want to model? You know, because operations is really modeling the work of the railroad or modeling the jobs. And we're going to compress those and pick and choose. Uh, you know, for one thing, in, in the transition era, which is a very popular modeling era, uh, there were 10 clerks for everybody in engine and train service. So, you know, normally I'd stand up in front of a clinic room and say, you know, uh, if I have a 10 person operating crew, I don't have enough room in this, in this clinic room uh, 
to, to house all the clerks. So, you know, we're going to compress some of those jobs. Um, in CTC, we're generally going to model the dispatcher and the train crews. We don't really need operators anymore. Uh, we're certainly going to have yard masters and so forth. But from a train control perspective, the the, the players, you know, to use the Frank Ellison, uh, uh, the railroad as a play, uh, the, the DS and the crews are the actors. Um, so we're generally trying to model communications between the dispatcher and crews. Um, we'd like, you know, for the sake of suspension of disbelief, I guess, uh, to keep the crews isolated so that they generally, you know, communicate, have the communications they would have had in the real world, and they're not really able to eavesdrop on chatter on the next train or trains hundreds of miles away. Uh, or certainly dozens of miles away. So we want to, the crews are isolated. We don't want radio chatter if we're in the transition era. Uh, we're going to use phones. Uh, if you want to communicate, you need to get to a phone. Uh, if you're a dispatcher and want to talk to a crew, you need to get them stopped and tell them to pick up the phone. Um, so, you know, in designing your phone system, you want to understand your operational requirements. Um, and, you know, those of you who are layout design geeks, as, as I am, uh, uh, you know, we, we have this concept of Givens and Druthers that was given to us by John Armstrong. Um, and so the questions are going to be, where do, you, where do you have room? Where are you going to put your phones? Um, to, to stay with the uh, prototypical uh, operation, we're going to try to keep them at control control points, although certainly there's no real reason why you can't have a phone on one side of the aisle serving a station on the other. It saves equipment, it saves phones being out in the aisle, maybe getting bumped, uh, as long as it's reasonably easy to reach and we don't have uh, phone cords uh, tight so that people are playing jump rope with them. Uh, so aisle width is a concern, you know, can we, can we safely get people by one another uh, while they're using phones in the aisle. And then there's a question of how much chatter you want in the layout room. Um, there's differences in opinion. Uh, I guess that would have to do with how uh, serious, you know, as opposed to having a little bit of fun and a little bit of chatter you want in your layout room. And I think we all enjoy the banter, but at some point it does get in the way of operations. Uh, another question that follows from this is do you want uh, prototypical phones which set the era, uh, but maybe older, more fragile, a little less reliable, a lot less durable, uh, and probably expensive and hard to find, or you know less expensive, modern, but uh, perhaps anachronistic equivalents? And there, there's plenty of compromises and just depends on what you want to do and what your space is. I mean, one thing you wouldn't do is take the older ERF type handsets, which are made of Bakelite and tend to shatter when they hit a hard floor and put them in a, con uh, a bare concrete uh, layout room. On the other hand, you know, if you're in a carpeted space uh, that's padded or, you know, laid on, on, on wood in an upper story, uh, you know, probably not much danger of damaging them. So, you know, that, that relates to your space. Um, okay, before we move on to some proto examples, uh, we can stop and take some questions. Put everybody to sleep already. No, nope, no. Nope. Must have the dreaded after dinner sp spot. Mark, you have a question? Chuck? Yeah, um, I have a question for you. I often ride, uh, before pandemic, I would ride the California Zephyr between uh, California and Colorado and always listened in with my uh, radio to the communications. And there's often several places out there where they lose all contact with um, the dispatcher. Um, I got the impression what they do in those cases is they just proceed at restricted speed until they finally get the signal back. But is that something that is ever modeled? 
Yeah, that's a great question, Hack. <laughs> you know, I, I'm not sure. I mean, I would think that, you know, if you've got signals, uh, you know, as long as you're seeing greens, everything's fine. Um, or in fact, as long as you're seeing something less restrictive than stop, you're, you just keep moving. Uh, in track warrant and DTC, you do get a piece of railroad, but uh, at some point you run out of railroad. So uh, hopefully the railroad has signal engineers who uh, figured out that when you get to the you know the the end of the DTC block or um, you know places that are operationally important and likely to be named in in track warrants that there's coverage. Otherwise, you've got a big problem, don't you? <laughs> well, yeah, and the one specific in incident came up in Ruby Canyon in western Colorado after a heavy rainstorm. And we went through in the morning and the rivers were really running high and the engineer literally stopped at a bridge and had the conductor get out and walk the train across the bridge. And this was all done with no communication possible with the dispatcher. And I didn't know whether I should be prepared to bail out myself if the train was going to go in the drink. Well, I, you know, if, if I were you, I think I would have gone back to the observation car and started dropping fusies. You're more, more likely to get hit, you know, uh, get hit from behind than, uh, um, than fall in the river. But neither of those sounds like much fun. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a good question. Uh, I have to look and see what UCOR says about it. You know, in, in, in certainly in the TT and TO days, there was uh, a great deal of discussion about what to do if there's a wire failure. Uh, because on the one hand, you don't want to stop the railroad. On the other hand, uh, uh, you know, you may have uh, restricting orders waiting for people that have not been able to get them. So there was a a great deal of protocol about in what order things got issued to avoid or at least minimize the possibility of that. Yeah, it, it also question. does come up in, pro, in the modeling world at the Silicon Valley lines in that big room, there are several spots where their Wi-Fi goes out and we were alerted in the remote operating session that you may lose contact with the dispatcher for a certain distance, just keep going at uh, in my case, I went at restricted speed because you don't know what you're going to get until you can talk to the man again. Whenever got a possible. Question for Mark, Mark Stafford. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, Seth, I was wondering um, over in Australia, the if you had a problem on the line, the conductor would climb off the train when it was stopped and hook up to the telephone lines, and he carried a portable handset and ring in. Um, do, is that the practice in the States as well? Yes. Yes. And in it fact, is. They, there were, there were uh, particular rules about where you would put the telephone line. I believe they were the innermost. It was on one arm, so they were close together because the conductor would have a thing that looked like uh, two inverted J's and one of them would be on one side of the line and the other would be on the other. And uh, you would get out there with something that looked a lot like an army field phone and uh, uh, get on the line that way. But it, you, you had to climb part way up the poles. Uh, there were, you know, you could do it with a ladder. The, typically uh, railroad line side poles didn't have steps. And the conductors did have spurs, but you know, the poles weren't in great shape and you got a lot of cutouts. And if you've ever climbed poles and had a cutout, you know, you really don't want that. You know, a piece of creosote splinter is, is very unpleasant for a very long time. So I'm pretty sure people didn't do that, particularly in bad weather, unless they absolutely had to. Um, but yeah, that we, we had basically the same thing. By the way, I'm, I, I am a collector of rule books, Mark, and if you uh, have any surplus ones or come across any good Australian ones, uh, you are hereby commissioned to uh, procure them at any reasonable price, and I will gladly reimburse you for that in shipping. Um, um, it, I, 
you know, it's just so interesting reading through the rule books and seeing what they did. I've got another one, Seth. Um, yeah. We also had, yeah, we had had um, a thing that we called staff and ticket, which was a staff when you entered a section, you would receive like effectively a key and that key gave you permission to be in that section and, and they couldn't hand out two keys to the single section was part of the safe working rules. Does that exist in the States? Well, it doesn't now, but it did. Um, and uh, there were a number of them. Um, I, two that come to mind were on Donner Pass and one for the uh, original um, um, tunnel at Stevens Pass, the, the first one before it was rebuilt, uh, had a staff system. Um, uh, and there were a few others in other places, but uh, uh, you know, they worked, uh, they were just expensive and, you know, our railroads didn't like to spend money uh, if they could avoid it. But yeah, that, that was done in the US. So is anybody modeling that? Are you modeling anything like that or have the ability to model it? Because it's a, it's a software program to do it, I would think. You could do it on your phone. You know, the only person I know who models a staff system is our friend Adrian over in... Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, I know who you mean. Adrian uh, Guz, Guz, yeah. My, Guz, man. Gunsberg, yeah. 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 Gunsberg, in, in, Gunsberg, in that's right. Um, but uh, there, there may be a few others. Uh, I'm not uh, familiar with them. It's, it's relatively unusual. Um, it, would, it would take somebody like that, you know, a... Uh, Oh, come on. Uh, Don Ball is the kind of guy who would do it, but he doesn't because Stockton and Copperopolis didn't have them. Um, Bruce. You have your hand up? Uh, unmute. I have to unmute. I, I have seen staff systems work on, uh, primarily on branch lines where when you enter the branch, you take the staff and then you have that that branch line, it's like a one-way branch and, and no one else can go onto the branch because you got the staff. And once yeah. you come off it, then you place it back where it was and you're right back, back again to, to normal operations. So it's just like what Mark was saying, you get a ticket, you only have the one train gets the ticket, nobody else gets it and it makes it easy to run on that branch. Well, it makes a ton of sense and it's nice for modeling too because you don't have to deal with all the cases of, oh, well, let's see, do I have to issue an out and back order or do I issue it back to where you re-enter the main? Do I need to you know, put a register there and then everybody has to stop and register, which is kind of a major pain and railroads wouldn't do it because it means stopping a lot of mainline trains. So yeah, I mean, it's a very clean solution. Thank you for answering those um, questions, Seth. Um, in the interest of time, we're going to have to limit the questions a little bit more, and we're straying a little bit off topic. I mean, I don't want to split hairs, but you're getting more into control disciplines than communications. So well, you're right, I am. But I, as you know, I am a geek for that stuff. So yeah. uh, okay. I hear you. let us stay focused. <laughs> Thanks, Jerry, for keeping us honest. Um, okay, so here's a couple of examples with, uh, you know, classic toggle type uh, USS. Uh, this is more or less a 506 machine. Uh, and this is your classic. And here's um, the, the next couple of examples are really more because they're friends of mine. Uh, Rick Kang, uh, much younger Rick Kang in Eugene, Oregon. Um, and what, what I'm just showing is a couple of pieces of the communication system. Um, Notice the uh, ubiquitous and uh, classic Shure SM55 mic. Um, he's got a little powered speaker up here and then he's got a radio system. So you can see we had both of these, which makes sense because it's the early eighties. Um, another example, actually the next, the next desk over uh, is, is a much younger uh, Breezy Gust. Um, those of us who know him will appreciate this picture. Um, 
And you can see he's got, also got a kind of variety of interesting period equipment. He's got the uh, Sure mic. Uh, he's got his uh, radio system. There's a speaker in here somewhere. Uh, you notice we have a 2554, which is a touch tone wall set, um, which is probably part of the railroad private branch exchange. Um, looks like he's settling in for a long night. And he's got a computer terminal with a wonderfully anachronistic full travel keyboard, or I should say, well, it wasn't anachronistic for him, but uh, there we go. Um, here's a, we're going back a few years. Uh, this is probably early 70s, given the 851 phone here. Uh, this is uh, outside in P line and PBX phone. This is uh, in Sacramento. But he's also got the 60A selector, which is uh, uh, essentially a party line signaling system that was designed for railroads. And uh, what's interesting is if you start looking at the documentation, it bears an amazing resemblance to the code line sender used by uh, USMS. And uh, these things date back to 1916. And I'm just presuming that because they coexisted in uh, railroad environments for years, both the railroad and signaling people were pretty familiar with each other's stuff. So, you know, moving forward, he's got a shotgun mic. This is highly directional. And the reason for it is his loudspeaker is pointing right down there. So this microphone is directional enough that the speaker can be blaring away and it won't feed back. And then you notice they're also using uh, They've basically gotten rid of telegraph at this point because you can see he's got a teletype over here. So this is the corner of what's probably a Model 32. And uh, he's probably getting lineups and things like that. Um, and the rest of the CTC board, I think you guys are generally familiar with. Okay, so how do communications work? Generally, you had employee call lights on the uh, phone booths uh, the phones were essentially local battery, magneto-type phones, uh, where there was a battery inside the phone, uh, fairly low impedance primary circuit, and it would drive the phone line, and at, usually at fairly heroic voltages, because you needed to get a lot of signal out there, because these things were intended to operate across a subdivision, or at least half a subdivision. So that was at least 60 miles of wire, usually uh, iron wire with copper, thick copper plating on it. Um, and uh, the dispatcher typically had a speaker. So you didn't actually ring him down most of the time, not that ring, ring down circuits were, were unknown, but generally the, the, the dispatcher had a, a loudspeaker. And whenever anybody went off hook, they would just pick up, they would, you know, go into their station and uh, or phone booth and announce their location. So, uh, you know, Bealeville, for example. Uh, and uh, the dispatcher would hear that and then could get on the line with, uh, usually with a microphone, sometimes with a regular uh, uh, handset type phone. Um, so the DS sets the signal to stop. Um, uh, and uh, then he lights the employee call lamp. Now, I did have a little talk with Rodney a couple of weeks ago, and we don't really support an employee call lamp per se in CATS, but we can set it up as just simply a separate turnout. So just imagine you have a turnout and you're going to uh, have that turnout control, uh, you know, fire in the field, and that can be lighting an LED. Uh, on, a, on a phone at the station. Um, and anyway, so the DS, of course, then codes it if you're using a CTC, you know, a 506 type machine. In CATS, this would happen more or less instantaneously. Then the lamp on the phone booth lights and stays lit. And then the crew picks up the phone, uh, you know, having stopped their train and seen the employee call light on. Um, crew announces themselves, dispatcher acknowledges, when he's done, this does not clear automatically in the real world. The dispatcher has to go turn the light off and code it again. Um, if a crew, you know, on their own motion wants to call or, uh, you know, if they've used a little hooky thing to get on the line because they've broken down, 
um, they'll announce their location. Uh, the dispatcher will hear that, and then the dispatcher will talk to them. And you know, at the end of the conversation, everybody will go back. So it's a fairly simple, from a telephone signaling perspective, uh, arrangement under CTC. Usually, the signaling is being done by the CTC system. A uh, lot more going on in TT and TO, which since I'm way behind, I'm going to just uh, move through. Okay. Um, are there any questions at this point, or should we just get into it? Let's get into it. All right. Yeah, so, Seth, Seth, maybe tomorrow yeah. you could upload the, uh, the slide deck. I will do that. And had I not been so negligent and not getting it done till five, <laughs> I would have done that earlier. No problem. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, I will be happy to do that. And the uh, standard version of it is, uh, you know, on my website also. So, uh, but you guys probably are more interested in this. Okay, so basically in a telephone system, all the phones are in parallel. And what you've got is a common power supply, a common, we're, we're gonna do this using common battery where the power is provided by the phone system rather than the local battery the way the prototype did it because it, it's a lot simpler and easier and perfectly practical for the distances in any uh, reasonable model railroad. And in fact, one of my systems in, uh, La Mesa, so I would say even in uh, maybe an unreasonable model railroad, not, not that they're unreasonable, it's just on the largest end of a model railroad. Um, and what you see is all these phones are in parallel running down the line. Now, normally we would home run the wiring just for ease of maintenance, but uh, the electrons don't care. And there's uh, other than auxiliary signaling, there's no particular reason to do it the other way. In CTC, where we can generally expect our nodes of our control system to be providing the lights, um, this is a perfectly reasonable way to do it. Um, we'll also have a dispatcher station, uh, which uh, for practical reasons in the model railroad, will typically want to co-locate with this common equipment over here. And we may have some additional signaling in the phone sense of, of uh, ringing and determining that the phone has come off hook and doesn't need to be rung anymore. Uh, so, uh, and most of the other functions that you'd have in a, a real world phone system don't particularly matter in the basement. So, you know, uh, over voltage protection uh, and, and things like that aren't a big problem for us. However, if you do run it in a conduit, any length of uh, in any length outside, like you've got an outbuilding and it's, you know, more than a few feet away, uh, it might be a good idea to think about those things uh, because you certainly can get ground currents induced by lightning strikes and things. So, um, you know, less of an issue in California, but, you know, if you're fortunate enough to live in a place where you got a lot of space and you've got an outbuilding a hundred feet away, uh, I'd probably think about protection. Okay, so, Planning. Um, you know, I think we can assume in the CTC world that the dispatcher will be at the console, um, but we do need to figure out where the phones are going to be on the layout. Um, and we're also going to need to find, uh, you know, a clean, well lighted place to put the common equipment. Usually it's on the floor somewhere, on, on, on a wall fairly low, somewhere near the dispatcher station. Um, so, you know, be sure there's room to work, there's comfortable access, uh, there's a place to sit so you can actually reach down and get to your wiring, and, uh, you know, some lighting would be nice. Um, you know, if people ask me to do one for them, this is what I ask. Um, all right, so having said that, let's talk about station equipment. Um, lots of ways to do stations. This is an approach I like to use these little uh, uh, fascia mounted hook switches and then the phone hangs in it and you know when the, you pull the phone off hook, then it's connected to the line. Um, this is Tommy Holtz. It's a Western Pacific system with a, a USS machine. What 
Tommy does is when he lights the maintainer call light, it actually lights up on the uh, on the hook switch. And there's plenty of room in the hook switch mounting to do this. So he's just got an LED, you know, with a dropping resistor, and I think he's applying 12 volts. So you know, probably a K ohm resistor um, works well. A couple of things to think about. Um, if you have a situation where a lot of people are likely to be off hook waiting to talk, I remember having run into this at Lee Nicholas's a few times, you get a lot of people breathing into their phones and waiting and it's sort of annoying and hard to hear, particularly if you have hearing problems anyway. Um, so push to talk handsets are good. That way uh, you don't actually uh, uh, you know, start making noise on the line until it's your turn to talk. Uh, there are also uh, noise canceling or what is sometimes called close talking microphones. They're the same thing. Um, so they tend to reject you know, chatter in the aisle and other stuff because sometimes it just gets overwhelming and you can't hear. Um, another thing, you know, a little more practical, perhaps more prototypical thing to do about that is enforce communication discipline. You know, use standard forms, don't talk if you don't have to. Um, everybody's got a few ex-military, uh, public safety, aviation people in their crew, and they can certainly, uh, you know, give you a quick summary of whatever discipline it is they use. Any of them will work fine. Um, Lots of choices and stations. Um, this is Otis McGee's layout. These are period, uh, uh, what are called 211 space, space saver hook switches with F-type handsets. F handsets look really cool, but one problem is that the handset back has kind of a triangular or almost papyrus stock configuration and you can't crook it under your neck. It will go flying off in space. And happily, Otis is in a very nicely furnished second floor uh, layout room that's got good carpeting. So if they fly off into space, nothing bad happens. But uh, as I mentioned earlier, you don't really want to be doing this on a hard floor. Um, Jack Burgess has got basically the same arrangement that Tom, Tommy Holt does, other than he didn't use maintainer call because he's got timetable and train order and he used his order boards. Uh, this is kind of my favorite scheme. Um, Dave Adams, another TTNTO guy, simply took one of these phones. I bet you grew up with this and had a wall phone like this in your kitchen. Um, took the cover off, took the dial out, and just shoved it through a box in the fascia. And that works fine. You can also do that with this style of phone. And that's fairly inexpensive because for the cost of a garage sale phone, which is, you know, 15, 20 bucks, even if you don't negotiate very hard, you've got all the parts you need, right? You've got a speech network, you've got a handset, you've got a hook switch. Um, so, you know, all those things work fine. And um, let's see. Um, and of course, you can just use a, a wall set. Um, so this is the rotary version. This is the slightly newer, uh, by newer, probably late 60s, early 70s, uh, touch tone version. This phone is a repro of the kind of 1947 to Sorry about that. Um, is he ever going to pick up? Okay. Uh, um, 354 set, which uh, is kind of transitional. There really weren't very many of these made. The phone it was based on as a desk set came out in the late 30s. And by the time they would have started making wall sets, there were wartime production restrictions. And frankly, these worked fine. So nobody was gonna devote scarce materials to this. Um, but you can buy repros of these for like 50 or 60 bucks. And it gives you a nice transition look if that's what you want. This is actually a touch tone dial if you press it, but if you don't look too closely, it looks pretty good. Uh, this is actually on Dave Houston, Southern Pacific. Um, let's see. So here's a little table summarizes all of that. Um, basically, you know, kind of in the middle of the price range or maybe a little high is the 
a hook switch on the fascia type approach. The vintage ones, you can go absolutely crazy, but you can match exactly what your railroad had in the day. Um, the uh, uh, old 554, 2554 set, by the way, if there's a two at the front, it's just the touchtone version of the old rotary version. If it has a one, it's the kind of rare 10 button touchtone pads. Those are collectors like them. There's no particular value to us one way or another. We're not using the dials. So I would just get, you know, whatever you can find at a garage sale or a junk store. Um, I keep a few around, but, you know, frankly, if you can get them locally, you're much better off because, you know, by the time you get done with a flat rate box, it's 15 bucks to ship one and it's only worth 20, you know, so that doesn't make much sense. Um, you can get repros. Uh, again, if you're looking for the look, don't want to spend the money and want something a little more uh, robust. And, you know, if you're just trying to have basic communications, you can find, still find very basic uh, uh, rotary corded phones, uh, you know, at Wally World and places like that. So, you know, those work fine. Um, Okay, so a little more detail on the space saver. Uh, this thing you've probably seen, it's about five inches high and two inches on a side. There's no room for the guts inside, so you have to wire them externally, but it's not a problem. They, they look nice and they work really well. Um, here's the original 300 desk set I mentioned. Oh, and here we go, we have that same repro again. Um, uh, you know, if you look around, you can usually find the prototype of this, but uh, it, it, it covers a fairly narrow period. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure how many were really in railroad service. Um, uh, you know, worst comes to worse, um, phone co is always there. Well, they're trying to sell the business, but they are there for now. And, uh, you know, they're very nice. When you get stuff from them, check it out because they don't have time to test everything and it is vintage stuff, but they will make good if you get back to them in a reasonable time. Um, okay, this is probably the most common phone you'll find uh, if you're, you know, garage sailing and uh, J-U-N-Q-E store shopping. It's the 500 set. It's your classic phone. We all grew up with it. Uh, it was designed by Henry Dreyfus of New York Central Streamline J3A fame. Uh, the features were an improved internal speech network, uh, appropriate from the 50s on, uh, has the G style handset, which you can wedge up in, you know, kind of like this and uh, won't fly off into space. Uh, if you get, you know, a real vintage one, the hook switch has extra contacts, which are very useful for signaling circuits. Um, you know, it's worth picking them up because there are three things we need to build the phone. It's the speech network, the handle, and the hook switch. And this one's got all three, this one's got two. Although Mike Chandler in um, New Westminster, British Columbia, actually made a little linkage so that he just took the uh, case off and used his little linkage and an external hook arrangement to uh, reuse the hook switch here. I, it's probably going a little overboard, but you know this is a very economical way to go. Um, as I say, this is my favorite. If people say, well, what should I use? And you don't have stuff around, this is probably it. Um, I sell this thing as a kit on my website. Um, usually fascia mounted. Um, you can do it with or without uh, push to talk handsets. Um, yeah, I mentioned speech networks. It's this funny little board that goes inside the uh, uh, phone. Sometimes it's a, a little can with the terminals on top. Um, it does a couple of things for you. It, it, if, most important, it controls side tone. Side tune is what you hear in your ear when you talk in a phone. And that's really important because you want to have what we call comfort noise, enough 
speech coming back that you're sure it's working, but not so much that you think it's too loud. And then you start talking quieter and quieter and quieter. And pretty soon all the other old guys on the line can't understand what you're saying. So that's important. Um, it has some very simple uh, uh, inductive capacitive circuitry that uh, puts most of the speech energy out on the line rather than into your ear, uh, which is exactly where we want it. Uh, it has some other circuitry that protects against clicks and pops, which is usually not that big of a deal on a, on a layout, but it also kind of enforces that all the phones play nice. So if one of them is, for one reason, they're trying to draw more current, uh, this self limits, so it won't do that. Um, the older 300 style phones have a, what's called a 101A inductor and a couple of other components that serve the same purpose. Um, it's not so fancy and you probably wouldn't like it if you lived two miles away from the central office uh, by cable route, but within our basements, it's perfectly okay. Um, so let's see here. Well, somehow or other I got onto dispatcher stuff here. Hang on a moment. Whoops. Oh, you're on dispatcher phones. Sorry. Oh, that's what I skipped ahead one. Okay. Um, phone questions real quick. Okay. Um, and these are all issues you can always call me and I'll be happy to talk to you about your particular application, whether you want to buy it from me or not. Um, so the dispatcher uh, is, I, I showed off here because he typically has somewhat different equipment. Um, generally, if there's a separate sound isolated room, I like a microphone, speaker, and foot switch. That way the dispatcher can work hands-free. If he's out in the layout room, then a noise canceling headset makes sense. Um, he can be heard pretty clearly on the line without picking up all the noise and he can hear well in his headset and you don't have the conversation echoing around the layout room. Um, you know, there are good call center headsets and if you use one at work, and can bring yours home, there are adapters available so you can basically take any standard phone and uh, use that kind of headset. Now, they are expensive, you know, they're 125 uh, to 150. Um, uh, as a result of that, I developed uh, a board that you can plug an inexpensive uh, uh, computer headset into um, and again use use that or uh, and use it with a, um, well, with or without a, uh, a foot pedal, if you like. So you can use it with a stomper and have it be stomp to talk. Or, you know, if you're comfortable with the uh, noise cancellation, uh, uh, it's fine. You know, one thing I've noticed, um, Hack probably has noticed it too, we both dispatch on a layout where I did a phone system. If you don't have a push to talk switch and you're just yakking with somebody who's in the dispatcher's area, then people on the line think you're busy talking and won't interrupt you. So it's sometimes better to just cut that off and you can be having a conversation up in the dispatcher's office. And when somebody comes over the speaker, then everybody hears it and you just get back to work. So even on a fairly busy railroad, you'll have some breaks. Um, let's see. Um, Okay, so hands-free was kind of the bottom line there. Um, here's some examples of uh, dispatcher phones. This is what we started with at Otis McGee's, you know, very simple. It's just a 300 set with a, an anachronistically modern uh, telephone style push button. Um, this is actually, I think on John Bros in uh, Peculiar, Missouri, and he's using, you know, the classic scissor phone. For most CTC installations, that's probably a little old. They probably replaced that when they put the console in, but you never know. And we went to these uh, at Otis's for the uh, operators. Um, here's the one that Hack and I work at, and it is that it's either Mike O'Brien or Cal Sexsmith. I'm not sure which dispatching. And what this is is a 
a call director that has a built-in headset. And these, not real common, but they were occasionally used for railroad service. Generally, railroads stayed away from these multi-button phones for dispatching. Um, and here's your, you know, mic speaker, and there is a stomper under here at Ed Loazzo's. And here's Lee Nicholas, and you can see he's got a mic and a speaker. He's also got an extra phone, so anybody who's uh, working in the area can reach in and, uh, uh, you know, get on the line. Um, and I think that's Rod Loader over here. Um, so, uh, anyway, lots of different kinds of dispatcher equipment. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I, th I think the scissor mount, you know, is pretty rare in our era, but you can use, uh, you know, as I say, the, the uh, Elvis style mic, uh, modern headphones, headsets, uh, just a regular phone, uh, noise canceling headset with our dispatcher board. All those things work pretty well. And, and that's not exhaustive. Uh, again, if you have something that works, that's great. Um, so here's an example of, you know, there's a prototype for anything. Um, this is Dorothy All at I think NS is XN Tower. And I wouldn't swear where that is. It's it's somewhere in NS land fairly south. But my guess is this is the early 80s because we've got a 3278 maybe uh, in the corner. Uh, some dis discussion of whether it's a 3274 or 37, 3278. The, uh, the IBMers among us, Mark, might know. Um, you can see this giant Oki data printer. You got a 554 wall set. You got Motorola radios. You got another uh, loudspeaker somewhat similar to what uh, we showed with Rick Kang. Then we've got the 107 type speaker like uh, Ed Loazzo had. Uh, she's got a scissor mount wall phone, which could date back to 15. You know, we know it's early 80s, right? Because there's a tray full of butts here, you know. And uh, you know, there's that manual thing with the funny keyboard that doesn't uh, that has a lot of travel and you, you can't backspace easily. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I love to do is the client brings me a picture. Oh, and, and here's a, you know, here's the 211 up here, a picture of the uh, dispatcher's office and we try and match it because you can find some really bizarre combinations of things. Okay, uh, here's my mic speaker arrangement. It uses this active telephone board or dispatcher operator board. And you can see it has uh, sockets for the audio in, audio out, uh, terminals for the stomper, and uh, just powered off a 24 volt wall wart. And it plugs into the phone line with a modular jack or with a screw terminal, your choice. You can have two so you can daisy chain them. Um, uh, quick bill of materials, you know, somewhere between 135 and 175, say 200 is a budgetary limit, unless you start going crazy with vintage equipment. Um, and this is basically the tear sheet for the product. You can read that on my website. Um, you'll need a foot switch. So lots of things you can do. Um, these are fairly inexpensive. I think I sell them for 20, it might be 25 these days. You might also have a perfectly good one if you've got a resistance soldering set. So just take that and have it power an AC relay and use the contact. Um, this is a vintage one. If you can find them, uh, they're probably $50. This one's in fairly rough shape. Um, and then my friend Dave Adams just uh, took a little hinge, a piece of wood, a spring, and a micro switch. So that works fine too. Um, powered speakers. Uh, I mean, here's some vintage ones. Um, this is the uh, 100F a vacuum tube, you know, two dual triodes. Um, you know, that takes us back. Uh, do you speak 12 AU7? Uh, this does. Um, and uh, this is a 60s one. I, I just like this, the style of this. It looks so industrial 
Western Electric and then Westcom was a, a manufacturer who did copies for non-Bell system people. By the way, railroads could buy from Western Electric, so they weren't under that general prohibition that Western Electric under the antitrust settlement of 56 could only sell to Bell operating companies. They were allowed to sell to the governments and to right-of-way companies. So railroads, pipeline companies, power line companies could buy Western Electric stuff. Um, but, you know, there's really no reason you can't just use a pair of powered computer speakers. So, you know, that works fine too. Okay, when we talk about common equipment, it's stuff that's not stations. It's all the stuff back in the backboard, usually a you know closet in the corner of the office, you know, more often than not stuffed with cleaning supplies that will eventually spill over something and cause a trouble call. Uh, ask me how I know. Um, so we need at a minimum a power supply and what we call a battery feed supply. Um, and then you'll need some wiring and some way to keep everything together. Uh, so what's battery feed? It essentially powers the phone. And what it does is it gives the phones whose microphones run on DC uh, a fairly low resistance source of DC with very high AC impedance so that when you're talking across the battery, it doesn't short out. Because if you ever tried to operate a phone across a, um, a battery, you won't hear anything. And the reason is that the battery is a perfect voltage source or as close as you're gonna get in the real world and will short out all the AC. So what we wanna do is um, essentially have a current source, which is very high impedance, but wants to push lots of current through. So that's, that's essentially what we do in the phone business. Traditionally, it was done with um, a very fancy choke. Um, so, these have become fairly rare. There used to be a few suppliers on eBay. Uh, I don't know, a couple of years after I started doing this clinic, which I think was 2004 at NMRA Seattle, uh, you know, they became very difficult to find. Okay, so anyway, the result of that, I got back together with a old partner of mine from a phone related business. And we essentially took a 50 year old design from Altec Lansing and, uh, took out everything you didn't need for a railroad phone system and uh, updated the parts list a little bit. And that's what we've got. But uh, I call it electronic battery feed 31A. And that's because it kind of emulates a 31A battery feed coil. Uh, these are old Western Electric designations. Um, you know, occasionally they show up on e eBay, but, you know, takes a while and we've got a few other features. So uh, certainly, if you come up with one of the original ones, that's cool, and I'm happy to help you with it. Um, if not, you know, the EBF was really designed to support that uh, dispatcher's office, uh, or I should say the, the chapter in the uh, operations compendium, because uh, I didn't want to tell people to go do something and buy a part that's on Obtainium. Um, what other things can you do? Um, well, you can find a, a real battery feed relay. Um, if you can find a balanced audio choke, that's essentially the same thing. Um, people have occasionally faked it with two chokes and it sort of works, but um, the noise rejection from stuff like DCC and nearby fluorescent ballasts is poor. Um, there are old phone company style intercoms of varying degrees of cleverness and uh, resistance to noise. Um, the one thing I'd stay away from is a small PBX because, you know, by the time you get dial tone, go off hook, dial the party, it doesn't sound like a lot, but in model railroad operating time, it's, it, it's, it's a long time and it's very awkward to bring more than one person in on the call. So anyway. Um, battery feed commercial you've heard. Um, you know, here's a basic phone system budget. Um, you know, 465 is a little aggressive, but you know, most, if my standard system, you know, I looked in a year or two ago and uh, 
they're typically about six stations and typically we can bring them in between five and six hundred dollars if you're not trying to do a lot of vintage stuff and a lot less if you have you know a stash of phones around so you know if you're thinking about doing it you know in your out garage sailing or um you know recreational shopping with your wife when that's possible to do again just keep your eye out for the old phones and that uh, that'll save you a lot of money um um, here's a fully operational system. This is actually the demo um, I used at uh, oh, NMRA the last time we had an NMRA. I guess that was, uh, was it Kansas City? Um, oh, Salt Lake. Um, and it's got one of the dispatcher boards and a battery feed board and a little uh, what I call a code buzzer, which is just a buzzer system that taps out each station's name in uh, in Morse, in railroad Morse. And you could do that, but generally in a CTC system, there would be no reason to, to do it. But it, one thing it does is it gives each station a distinct ring. And if you're gonna just make them arbitrarily different, I mean, it's cute and railroady, but it's, you know, you don't need to do that. Um, so this has pretty much got everything. You know, he's got his uh, stomper, he's got his power, got a little push button. Uh, the phones all are in parallel with uh, this jack. And he would just uh, plug his uh, uh, headset in here. And let's see, this is a brand new picture uh, circa this afternoon. And we've got a slightly newer version that allows you to daisy chain from board to board and supplies power so that all these guys can share a single 24 volt. So it just makes installation a little easier. This board uh, has tie points. It can have anywhere between two and 12 uh, stations driven off it. And it gives you a place to tie down uh, the tip side of the line, the ring side of the line. And tip and ring are the two sides of the phone line. I, I'm assuming everybody knew that, but it goes back to old switchboard jacks that had a little tip and then an insulator and then a ring and then an insulator and a sleeve. So tip and ring were the top part, part of it. And uh, also a pair of for uh, typically 12 volts and ground for running buzzers and auxiliary stuff and uh, a place to install a little bucking converter if you need power. So basically you do it all with a 124 volt circuit. It powers all of your boards and derive some auxiliary power for the phones. Uh, let's see. So, you know, ringing and buzzing, as I say, I'm generally assuming CTC guys will be driving that off their uh, layout control bus, whatever it is. Um, um, let's see. Yeah, and you know, we were talking about maintainer call lights earlier. And again, this is the code buzzer I talked about, and it just uses a little Arduino here. So this is a fairly cheap board. It's like $35, $40, something like that. And I'll happily program it up for you with whatever stations you want. And let's see, um, other handy widgets. Um, again, this is more for arrangements where you're gonna be using, um, buzzers or, or train order boards, but uh, this latch arrangement is just a simple relay circuit so that when a station is called, it lights up and stays lit and then uh, is released under control of the hook switch. So if people are forgetting to turn off the maintainer call lights, you could wire one of these up and uh, when the crew actually gets there and picks up the phone, then it turns the light off and doesn't annoy people. Uh, Sometimes you'll have applications where you'd like to know when the phone is on and off hook, uh, you know, and have it light up a, a lamp field or uh, operate, you know, the one of these latches to clear it. Uh, but the phone is sealed and doesn't have any auxiliary contacts. That's one of the reasons I like the old Western Electric phones. Um, so you can drive that with this little board, which is. Uh, uh, yeah, you can think of it as a, you know, a occupancy detector for phones. Um, and uh, this will uh, release, uh, 
you know, can be used to indicate the state of a phone that doesn't have a built-in hook, uh, extra hook switch contact. Um, let's see, getting to the end here, kind of running over my time anyway. Wiring hints, uh, I generally use Cat5. It's inexpensive. It has a couple extra pairs for auxiliary functions. I would generally use the blue pair for talk the orange pair for a hook switch indication, in other words, off hook, uh, if you've got a phone that supplies it. Green for a light that you're sending out that would light on the phone. Brown for ringing and buzzing. I would suggest keeping the wiring away from DCC uh, high, you know, high voltage power, AC, uh, ballast, anything that will induce noise. Um, let's see. Big complaints, in fact, I was just working with a customer today who uh, uh, was uh, tired of his home built system, which had noise and volume problems. Um, use high impedance battery feed, in his case, using uh, uh, a battery feed circuit instead of uh, a big resistor, uh, basically took the system from unusable to pretty good. Let's see if it works like this. Um, and I've done this for several people. Um, busy indicator. Um, so you can take a, and put a light on the phone uh, to indicate that the circuit is in use. That way, particularly if you're not using uh, push to talk handsets, people are warned that the conversation is in progress and maybe not to pick up and just start talking without listening first. Um, push to talk or noise canceling headsets are great. I see Dave Parks joined us. Um, David's uh, layout, I think we have push to talk handsets that also are noise canceling. But David has a very large crew and wide aisles, so a lot of people tend to congregate sometimes. Um, the one thing you might be tempted to do that I would kind of recommend you not unless there's no alternative is amplified handsets. So the thought is, oh, well, it's really noisy. If I amplify the handset, um, I'll be able to hear better. But the problem is it amplifies everything on the line. And the noise problem is typically that all the phones that are off hook waiting to talk are picking up noise in the aisle. So this is great if you have a truly hearing impaired person. And the nice thing is that this vintage equipment works well with uh, magnetic pickups and most high quality uh, hearing aids. Um, but it's not a very good general purpose use. Uh, let's see, um, oh, Cat5 again, it's cheap. Um, in fact, if you uh, find somebody who's remodeling their office, they may very well have ripped all the old stuff out. Here's a hint, almost always it's perfectly okay the next time. Um, the guy ripping it out was probably gonna take it over to a scrap dealer and use the proceeds to fund the beer and pizza for the cutover party. So if you want some, I would say, you know, pull out a 20 and let him buy the beer and pizza and you keep the wire and save him the trip over to the scrap dealer. Um, okay, so it's, uh, if not, use some kind of twisted pair because it's really going to help reject noise. And we've got DCC, which is a giant, you know, antenna radiating 16 kilohertz, which is close enough to audio uh, that it can be annoying. Um, for connecting blocks, you can use the telephone connector board I showed you, terminal strips, telephone style 66 blocks, Euro connectors. Um, I, I don't like Euro connectors because they don't work that well for 24 gauge wire, but you know, your mileage may vary. Um, the electrons don't care much as long as you make a solid connection. Just do something that's documentable and uh, hence maintainable. And I've got tons of wiring diagrams that are just there for the taking. Um, here's a couple of things that are bad ideas. Uh, some of you, again, you know I'm into layout design. We have a saying in the LD SIG, make only new mistakes. Here's some old mistakes you cannot make. Um, wireless multi-handset systems, uh, they're inexpensive. And if it's your first operating system and you have no phone system, and it's nine o'clock and you're passing Costco or Wally World on the way home, uh, it's okay, but um, uh, they don't work very well and you'll get tired of it real fast. Uh, way too much effort to make a call, tiny little buttons, no two alike, um, <clears throat> internal volume, not great, not a party line, 
um, generally not great. Uh, trying to get away without choked or balanced battery feed. Um, I just gave you a couple of war stories. Don't do it. Low volume, poor side tone rejection. In other words, everybody hears everything th themselves in your ear so they don't talk loud enough. Very poor party line performance. Um, series wiring, yeah, sort of get away with it for two phones, but not a good idea. Again, poor side tone rejection and not reliable at all. Any failure in the wiring will key your whole system. Um, and here's the references and all the good stuff. And here's a bunch of people, some of whom sadly are no longer with us who have been tremendous help over the years. Okay, questions? Uh, yeah, I have one for you. Uh, first, let me just say, I like the idea of using the Morse code uh, to give different signals. That's especially useful in layouts where there's lots of phones, you hear lots of ringing, and in about 10 minutes, everybody knows exactly which code refers to them, especially if they've been taking Morse like I have for 65 years. Uh, my question concerns the, um, the train order operators and the dispatcher. Sometimes train order operators need to talk to other train order operators. In the real world, do they always do that with a separate phone? Because I can imagine the dispatcher would not be happy if he picks up and tries to call a train order operator and gets a busy signal because the guy's talking to somebody else. And then if so, yeah, how do you simulate that in the model world? Well, you know, the, the railroad would have done is uh, used a second circuit in one of a couple of ways. Um, in, in really busy areas like tower corridors, there were, there were multiple lines and we, we sort of simulated it in a not particularly prototypical method on David Park's layout, um, but it works pretty well. So basically each tower has a line and if you want to talk to that tower, you pick it up. Um, and that would occasionally happen on a linear railroad. Um, the other thing in more modern times, they would usually also have what was called a PBX line. So there, it was, you know, the administrative phone system for the railroad. But very often the operators, when they were doing that, were more in their wearing their clerk hat. And, you know, they were trying to arrange pickups of, of LCL and stuff like that. Um, and they would use the PBX. So there's no particular rule that you couldn't use it, but you know, for conveying train order authority, most railroads had, uh, uh, oh, should I stop sharing here or did you already kill me? Oh, we're good. Um, uh, so they, you know, you would, you, you weren't supposed to issue train order authorities. Again, that's a little bit out of, scope for for our CTC discussion here. But, uh, you know, I, you could certainly communicate on another channel and sometimes one was explicitly provided. Uh, in the case of towers, those were for authority and I think they were so designated. So also in that regard, then would the dispatcher potentially have a, an override switch week where he could automatically force the other guys call to interrupt and then put himself on the line with the person he's trying to reach. Um, Strategic Air Command had a system like that called Autovon, but I've never heard being done in the railroads. Doesn't mean it didn't happen. I just don't know about it. But yeah, there was absolutely on an Autovon phone, there's an extra row of keys. So it's got 16 buttons. And there's one on the bottom, which uh, is called FO, which um, officially stands for uh, flash override, but I think most people know what it really stands for. Um, that was a great talk, Seth. I'm, I know in my case, you definitely have the wheels turning in my head. I'm probably not gonna sleep tonight, but uh, <laughs> the, the, the big decision for me is gonna be, what do I do next, the phone system or the physical signals? So, Oh, well, yeah, good question. I mean, they're both great problems to have because they're both fascinating. Um, yeah. You know, and you guys know I am uh, can always arrange to, uh, you know, have a nice long conversation with you and, uh, you know, figure out what we can do to, you know, make the right 
system for you and you know your layout, your plans, uh, you know, and uh, certainly encourage you to use local materials and inexpensively if you can. Yeah, I, I was fortunate to pick up a uh, candlestick phone a couple of years ago, very cheap. In fact, I also got the com box that was in a tower and uh, it, it was from a Pensy tower, but it wasn't advertised as such. I just went out to pick up a Western electric one just to have as a decoration. And I got looking at the photos and recognized the numbers and I, I, nobody else was bidding on it. It wasn't advertised PRR. Got it out of a, a very commonly known tower. So, but yeah, I'm hoping That's to so maybe. Cool. I, I'm hoping to resurrect. Those are funny. Camp. I mean, oh, that is so cool. That is but, so cool. You know, I'll show because it to you real quick. those things, those things were, you know, I never real common, but they weren't fancy. And then they just started getting scarcer and scarcer and the prices got bid up and bid up and bid up. Oh, look Cut at you, that's Hold great. On. I'll turn off the background. Oh, nice with switch. the lever switches and everything. How cool. That's really nice. Yeah, so I'm, I'm looking at the screen and moving things in the wrong direction. So. I'm looking at these labels across the top here. And uh, one said West Block, one said East Block. And handwritten in them, the West Block was gray, East Block was Hunt. So I intuitively thought, okay, that's maybe the next station, the next tower each direction. And so that, that brought me down to about three or four possible towers third one is for the train dispatcher and then you got one for the west bridge one for the east bridge so those are the ends of the interlocking and then there was a local number and uh the interesting thing about the local number is uh this was uh what's it say six i can't read it anymore <laughs> anyway the number didn't have enough digits for today's numbers. So I did a Google search and it confirmed it belonged to the town, which was where one of the three tower, missing towers was. And it, this came out of Spruce Creek. And uh, so you, you, you flip these up and down and I assume you can make it a party line by having more than one connected and there's jacks down across the bottom and there's some exactly ring stuff right. out here. There's ring stuff out here. I don't know exactly how all that works, but it's kind of cool to have. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you could do a lot of interesting things with those. The, you know, the, the, the row of lever keys is more or less the same as a multi-button phone, you know, of the 60s, 70s, and 80s, you know, where you, you had a series of them and, it, you know, you'd punch one down and the others would pop up. But the beauty of that style is you could have multiple ones at the same time. And one of the nice things uh, for railroad phone systems was they had all these, what they called appliques, which were just little chunks of circuit um, that, um, let's see here. I don't want to do that. Um, uh, so you could have, you know, one, key being, you know, the local exchange line, like you, you mentioned for Spruce Creek, the little town. And yeah. then, you know, maybe another one is a private line for the next tower. And, you know, there may be different types of circuits. So some of those signaling keys over on the right were probably applying ringing or at least starting up a signal that would, some circuit that would signal the party at the other end. And you yeah. could mix and match. Um, so, you know, it seems kind of bulky and funky, but it was very, very flexible and, uh, it's just wonderful stuff. It's so nice. It's being preserved. Other questions? All right. Looks like that's a wrap, Seth. That was fantastic. Um, I appreciate you, uh, doing this for us. Thank you and good night.